I've been asked to explain why I, a New Zealander, does not feel that the United Kingdom should join that other great union, the European Union. Now, I've deliberately said join because although the UK is already a member of the European Union, I think it is fair to say that it has, at times, been a reluctant member. From the date it first joined until today, there have been many occasions the UK has called into question its membership. Whilst it was fit and proper to join in 1973, today's European Union is a much different and bigger beast, which I am not sure that even Harold Wilson would be so keen to join. By retaining its membership, the continuing question of UK sovereignty will remain. How much of the UK legislative agenda will be driven by the requirement to embrace, in UK law, the collective view of the Union? Will our own Supreme Court be subordinate to the European Court of Justice? The EU of today is involved in so much more than simply opening up trade borders. It has its own Foreign Affairs Department, headed up by at one stage UK's Baroness Ashton, someone who never held an elected position nor had any foreign affairs experience prior to her appointment as the EU Foreign Minister. But that's the EU for you. Our own Prime Minister even attempted to veto the unelected appointment of the head of the EU a few years ago. A position that came with a personal motorcade of five limousines. Why one individual needs so many cars is beyond me. Perhaps these European engineered cars aren't that reliable. The salary wasn't bad either at 300,000 euros. Sadly, this was yet another EU position that the UK had to back down on. An all too familiar theme during our membership notwithstanding Margaret Thatcher's altogether much more forceful negotiating stance. The EU has its own currency, the Euro, although that's another sticking point with the UK's membership. Of course, the UK has successfully held on to the pound, but equally had to contribute significantly to other European countries when they spend more than they earn. It seems only a short time ago we were talking about Greece having to leave the EU. Now, I could discuss all the economists who say leaving would be a bad decision. Then I could outline all the economists who say it would be an economically sound decision. But quite frankly, who's right and who's wrong? As all financial advertising tells you, past performance is no indication of future performance. The debate is really a bit like the hokey-cokey. Should we be in? Should we be out? In, out, in, out. Shake it all about. That's what it's all about. Hey! I head up the compliance function at CSS Investments. I have been working in compliance for a number of years, as the grey hairs on my head testify to. When I started out, the firms I worked for were regulated by an organisation called IMRO, or the Investment Management Regulatory Organisation. The rule book which firms had to comply with was a slim two-volume folder. The EU, with its good intent to harmonise the rules for dealing in securities across Europe, required countries within the community to implement the Market and Financial Instruments Directive or MIFID for short. The two volume rule book expanded into over 12 and counting and my career has never looked back. Now what can a Kiwi from a little island in the Pacific tell you about how to vote on such an important issue? Actually we were one of the first countries to vote on a union. Over 100 years ago we had to decide whether or not to join the other sovereign states of New South Wales, Victoria, Queensland, Tasmania and South Australia to create the United States of Australia, or just simply Australia as we know it today. New Zealand actually decided not to join this union, although this did not stop them from including New Zealand in the preamble to the Australian Constitution, in which it still states, and I quote, the state shall mean such of the colonies of New South Wales, New Zealand, Queensland, etc. 
but that's Australia for you. Has not been part of this union held Australia, New Zealand back? I can answer this in one word. Well, two really, all blacks. If a little country of four million people and 70 million sheep can hold its own in the world stage, surely the UK with a population of 64 million, but admittedly only 23 million sheep, can do likewise, rugby aside. Naturally, any change in uncertainty is unsettling, but I fail to see how leaving this union will cause Armageddon to the United Kingdom. I am sure trade between the two blocs will continue. Germany will continue to want to sell its cars to the UK. The French its wine, the Italians its salami, Belgium its chocolates, and the UK will still get to sell its Weetabix to whoever can stomach them in Europe. And relax. Lidl and IKEA, I am sure, will continue to operate their stores within the UK. The world as we know it will not come to an end, despite what some commentators, politicians and doomsayers may claim. Europe has survived two cataclysmic conflicts, and I am sure leaving the EU cannot be any more traumatic, can it? Of course there will be change, as indeed there have been with the original EEC. The question is whether we want to continue to support with our taxes the EU juggernaut that continues to operate from both Strasbourg and Brussels at an estimated cost of 200 million euros. The millions of UK tax pounds spent to support these European institutions could, I feel, be better spent on our hospitals and schools, as opposed to the EU leaders' five limousines. And as for the claim that the EU has stopped future European conflicts, as someone whose ancestors fought in Gallipoli, in the trenches in France, the battlefields in North Africa and Italy, conflicts started by politicians, I am sure it has been the opportunities for discussion, whether as part of the United Nations, as a permanent member of the Security Council, being part of NATO, or part of the World Trade Organization, that collectively have kept Europe and the UK free from conflict. Deciding whether to leave any partnership can be painful in the short term, of course. There will, however, be opportunities for new partnerships, so much easier when you're free and single. In this, Her Majesty's 90th birthday, what better way of embracing the Commonwealth by redefining once again the trading links that were once part of the Great British Empire? So come the 23rd of June, think not about the present, but the future. Whether this island nation will be better served by being an independent partner with Europe and the world, or alternatively, whether it is prepared to embrace in full all that is entailed in being a committed member of the European Union, for better or worse, for richer or poorer, in sickness and in health, until death or economic Armageddon they do part. Thank you.